Brahman, Sanskrit, Brahmana is a varna class in Hinduism specializing as priests, teachers acharya and protectors of sacred learning across generations. The traditional occupation of Brahmins was that of priesthood at the Hindu temples or at socio-religious ceremonies and rite of passage rituals such as solemnizing a wedding with hymns and prayers. Theoretically, the Brahmins were the highest ranking of the four social classes. In practice, Indian texts suggest that Brahmins were agriculturalists, warriors, traders and have held a variety of other occupations in India. <inaudible> Vedic sources Purusha <inaudible> Sukta <inaudible> The earliest inferred reference to Brahman as a possible social class as in the Rigveda, occurs once, and the hymn is called Purusha Sukta. According to this hymn in Mandala 10, Brahmins are described as having emerged from the mouth of Purusha, being that part of the body from which words emerge. This Purusha Sukta Varna verse is now generally considered to have been inserted at a later date into the Vedic text, possibly as a charter myth. Stephanie Jameson and Joel Brereton, a professor of Sanskrit and religious studies, state. There is no evidence in the Rigveda for an elaborate, much subdivided and overarching caste system. And, the Varna system seems to be embryonic in the Rigveda and, both then and later, a social ideal rather than a social reality. Shratha Sutras Ancient texts describing community-oriented Vedic yajna rituals mention four to five priests, the Hadar, the Advaryu, the Udgatar, the Brahman and sometimes the Ritvij. The functions associated with the priests were The Hatri recites invocations and litanies drawn from the Rigveda. The Advaryu is the priest's assistant and is in charge of the physical details of the ritual like measuring the ground, building the altar explained in the Yajurveda. The Advaryu offers oblations. The Udgatri is the chanter of hymns set to melodies and music saman drawn from the Samaveda. The Udgatar, like the Hadar, chants the introductory, accompanying and benediction hymns. The Brahman recites from the Atharvaveda. The Ritvij is the chief operating priest. According to Kulkarni, the Grhya sutras state that Yajna, Adhyayana studying the Vedas and teaching, Dana Pratagraha accepting and giving gifts are the peculiar duties and privileges of Brahmins. Topic. Brahman and renunciation tradition in Hinduism The term Brahman in Indian texts has signified someone who is good and virtuous, not just someone of priestly class. Both Buddhist and Brahmanical literature, states Patrick Olivelle, repeatedly define Brahman, not in terms of family of birth, but in terms of personal qualities. These virtues and characteristics mirror the values cherished in Hinduism during the sannyasa stage of life, or the life of renunciation for spiritual pursuits. Brahmins, states Olivelle, were the social class from which most ascetics came. <laughs> Dharmasutras and Dharmashastras The Dharmasutras and Dharmasatras text of Hinduism describe the expectations, duties and role of Brahmins. The rules and duties in these Dharma texts of Hinduism, are primarily directed at Brahmins. The Gautama's Dharmasutra, the oldest of surviving Hindu Dharmasutras, for example, states in verse 9.54-9.55 that a Brahmin should not participate or perform a ritual unless he is invited to do so, but he may attend. Gautama outlines the following rules of conduct for a Brahmin, in chapters 8 and 9. Be always truthful. Conduct himself as an Aryan. Teach his art only to virtuous men. Follow rules of ritual purification. Study Vedas with delight. Never hurt any living creature. Be gentle but steadfast. Have self-control. Be kind, liberal towards everyone. Chapter 8 of the Dharma Sutra, states Olivelle, asserts the functions of a Brahmin to be to learn the Vedas, the secular sciences, the Vedic supplements, the dialogues, the epics, and the Puranas, to understand the texts and pattern his conduct according to precepts contained in this texts, to undertake sanskara rite of passage and rituals, and lead a virtuous life. The text lists eight virtues that a Brahmin must inculcate: compassion, patience, lack of envy, purification, tranquility, auspicious disposition 
compassion, generosity and lack of greed, and then asserts in verse 9.24-9.25, that it is more important to lead a virtuous life than perform rites and rituals, because virtue leads to achieving liberation moksha, a life in the world of Brahman. The later Dharma texts of Hinduism such as Bhadhyana Dharmasutra add charity, modesty, refraining from anger and never being arrogant as duties of a Brahmin. The Vasistha Dharmasutra in verse 6.23 lists discipline, austerity, self-control, liberality, truthfulness, purity, Vedic learning, compassion, erudition, intelligence and religious faith as characteristics of a Brahmin. In 13.55, the Vasistha text states that a Brahmin must not accept weapons, poison, or liquor as gifts. The Dharmasastras, such as Manumriti, like Dharmasutras, are codes primarily focused on how a Brahmin must live his life, and their relationship with a king and warrior class. Manumriti dedicates 1,034 verses, the largest portion, on laws for and expected virtues of Brahmins. It asserts, for example, a well-disciplined Brahmin, although he knows just the Savitri verse, is far better than an undisciplined one who eats all types of food and deals in all types of merchandise though he may know all three Vedas. John Busanich states that the ethical precepts set for Brahmins, in ancient Indian texts, are similar to Greek virtue ethics, that Manu's dharmic Brahmin can be compared to Aristotle's man of practical wisdom, and that the virtuous Brahmin is not unlike the Platonic Aristotelian philosopher with the difference that the latter was not sacerdotal. History According to Abraham Airely, Brahman as a Varna hardly had any presence in historical records before the Gupta Empire era, 3rd century to 6th century CE, and no Brahmin, no sacrifice, no ritualistic act of any kind ever, even once, is referred to in any Indian text." Dated to be from the 1st century CE or before. Their role as priests and repository of sacred knowledge, as well as their importance in the practice of Vedic Shratha rituals grew during the Gupta Empire era and thereafter. However, the knowledge about actual history of Brahmins or other Varnas of Hinduism in and after 1st millennium is fragmentary and preliminary, with little that is from verifiable records or archaeological evidence, and much that is constructed from a historical Sanskrit works and fiction. Michael Witzel writes, Toward a history of the Brahmins, current research in the area is fragmentary. The state of our knowledge of this fundamental subject is preliminary, at best. Most Sanskrit works are a historic or, at least, not especially interested in presenting a chronological account of India's history. When we actually encounter history, such as in Rajatarangini or in the Gopalavamsavali of Nepal, the texts do not deal with Brahmins in great detail. <laughs> Normative occupations The Gautama Dharmasutra states in verse 10.3 that it is obligatory on a Brahmin to learn and teach the Vedas. Chapter 10 of the text, according to Olivelle translation, states that he may impart Vedic instructions to a teacher, relative, friend, elder, anyone who offers exchange of knowledge he wants, or anyone who pays for such education. The chapter 10 adds that a Brahmin may also engage in agriculture, trade, lend money on interest, while chapter 7 states that a Brahmin may engage in the occupation of a warrior in the times of adversity. Typically, asserts Gautama Dharmasutra, a Brahmin should accept any occupation to sustain himself but avoid the occupations of a Shudra, but if his life is at stake a Brahmin may sustain himself by accepting occupations of a Shudra. The text forbids a Brahmin from engaging in the trade of animals for slaughter, meat, medicines, and milk products even in the times of adversity. The Apastamba Dharmasutra asserts in verse 1.20.10 that trade is generally not sanctioned for Brahmins, but in the times of adversity he may do so. The chapter 1.20 of Apastamba, states Olivelle, forbids the trade of the following under any circumstances, human beings, meat, skins, weapons, barren cows, sesame seeds, pepper, and merits. The first millennium CE Dharmasastras, that followed the Dharmasutras contain similar recommendations on occupations for a Brahmin, both in prosperous or normal times, and in the times of adversity. The widely studied Manumriti, for example, states, Except during a time of adversity, a Brahmin ought to sustain himself by following a livelihood that causes little or no harm to creatures. He should gather wealth just sufficient for his subsistence through irreproachable activities that are specific to him, without fatiguing his body. 
4.2 to 4.3 He must never follow a worldly occupation for the sake of livelihood, but subsist by means of a pure, upright and honest livelihood proper to a Brahmin. One who seeks happiness should become supremely content and self-controlled, for happiness is rooted in contentment and its opposite is the root of unhappiness. 4.11-4.12 The Manumriti recommends that a Brahmin's occupation must never involve forbidden activities such as producing or trading poison, weapons, meat, trapping birds and others. It also lists six occupations that it deems proper for a Brahmin, teaching, studying, offering yajna, officiating at yajna, giving gifts and accepting gifts. Of these, states Manumriti, three which provide a Brahmin with a livelihood are teaching, officiating at yajna, and accepting gifts. The text states that teaching is best, and ranks the accepting of gifts as the lowest of the six. In the times of adversity, Manumriti recommends that a Brahmin may live by engaging in the occupations of the warrior class, or agriculture or cattle herding or trade. Of these, Manumriti in verses 10.83-10.84 recommends a Brahmin should avoid agriculture if possible because, according to Olivelle translation, agriculture "...involves injury to living beings and dependence of others," when the plough digs the ground and injures the creatures that live in the soil. However, adds Manumriti, even in the times of adversity, a Brahmin must never trade or produce poison, weapons, meat, soma, liquor, perfume, milk and milk products, molasses, captured animals or birds, beeswax, sesame seeds or roots. Topic. Actual occupations Historical records, state scholars, suggest that Brahmin Varna was not limited to a particular status or priest and teaching profession. Historical records from mid-first millennium CE and later, suggest Brahmins were agriculturalists and warriors in medieval India, quite often instead of as exception. Donkin and other scholars state that Hoysala Empire records frequently mention Brahmin merchants, carried on trade in horses, elephants and pearls and transported goods throughout medieval India before the 14th century, the Pali Canon depicts Brahmins as the most prestigious and elite non-Buddhist figures. They mention them parading their learning. The Pali Canon and other Buddhist texts such as the Jataka tales also record the livelihood of Brahmins to have included being farmers, handicraft workers and artisans such as carpentry and architecture. Buddhist sources extensively attest, state Greg Bailey and Ian Mabbott, that Brahmins were supporting themselves not by religious practice, but employment in all manner of secular occupations." In the classical period of India. Some of the Brahmin occupations mentioned in the Buddhist texts such as Jatakas and Sutta Nipata are very lowly. The Dharmasutras too mention Brahmin farmers, according to Haydar and Sardar, in the Islamic sultanates of the Deccan region, and unlike the Mughal Empire, Teluguna Yoga Brahmins served the Muslim sultans in many different roles such as accountants, ministers, revenue administration and in judicial service. The Deccan Sultanates also heavily recruited Marathi Brahmins at different levels of their administration during the days of Maratha Empire in the 17th and 18th century. The occupation of Marathi Brahmins ranged from administration, being warriors, to being de facto rulers. After the collapse of Maratha Empire, Brahmins in Maharashtra region were quick to take advantage of opportunities opened up by the new British rulers, they were the first community to take up Western education and therefore dominated lower level of British administration in the 19th century. Eric Bellman states that during the Islamic Mughal Empire era Brahmins served as advisors to the Mughals, later to the British Raj. The East India Company recruited from the Brahmin communities of the present day Uttar Pradesh and Bihar regions for the Bengal army many Brahmins, in other parts of South Asia lived like other Varna, engaged in all sorts of professions. Among Nepalese Hindus, for example, Niels Guchau and Axel Michaels report the actual observed professions of Brahmins from 18th to early 20th century included being temple priests, minister, merchants, farmers, potters, masons, carpenters, coppersmiths, stone workers, barbers, gardeners among others. Other 20th century surveys, such as in the state of Uttar Pradesh, recorded that the primary occupation of almost all Brahmin families surveyed was neither priestly nor Vedas related, but like other Varnas, range from crop farming 80% of Brahmins, dairy, service, labor such as cooking, and other occupations. The survey reported that the Brahmin families involved in agriculture as their primary occupation in modern times plow the land themselves, many supplementing their income by selling their labor services to other farmers. 
Topic: <laughs> Brahmins, Bhakti movement and social reform movements. Many of the prominent thinkers and earliest champions of the Bhakti movement were Brahmins, a movement that encouraged a direct relationship of an individual with a personal god. Among the many Brahmins who nurtured the Bhakti movement were Ramanuja, Nimbarka, Vallabha and Madhvacharya of Vaishnavism, Ramananda, another devotional poet San. Born in a Brahmin family, Ramananda welcomed everyone to spiritual pursuits without discriminating anyone by gender, class, caste or religion such as Muslims. He composed his spiritual message in poems, using widely spoken vernacular language rather than Sanskrit, to make it widely accessible. His ideas also influenced the founders of Sikhism in 15th century, and his verses and he are mentioned in the Sikh scripture Adi Granth. The Hindu tradition recognizes him as the founder of the Hindu Ramanandi Sampradaya, the largest monastic renunciant community in Asia in modern times. Other medieval era Brahmins who led spiritual movement without social or gender discrimination included Andal, 9th century female poet, Basava, 12th century Lingayatism, Danyanishwar, 13th century Bhakti poet, Vallabha Acharya, 16th century Vaishnava poet, among others. Many 18th and 19th century Brahmins are credited with religious movements that criticized idolatry. Idolatry. For example, the Brahmins Raja Ram Mohan Roy led Brahmo Samaj and Dayananda Saraswati led the Arya Samaj. <laughs> Modern demographics and economic condition According to 2007 reports, Brahmins in India are about 5% of its total population. The Himalayan states of Uttarakhand 20% and Himachal Pradesh 14% have the highest percentage of Brahmin population relative to respective states total Hindus. Also, the participation of Brahmins in present government is very high. According to a Wall Street Journal report, an estimated 65% of the Brahmin households in India, with about 40 million people, lived on less than $100 a month in 2004. This number dropped to about 50% in 2007. Brahmins have also included wealthier and politically successful members. In Buddhist and Jaina texts The term Brahman appears extensively in ancient and medieval sutras and commentary texts of Buddhism and Jainism. In Buddhist Pali canon, such as the Majjhima Nikaya and Devadaha Sutta, first written down about 1st century BCE, the Buddha is attributed to be mentioning Jain Brahmins and ascetics, as he describes their karma doctrine and ascetic practices. The Blessed One Buddha said, There are, O monks, some ascetics and Brahmins who speak thus and are of such opinion, whatever a particular person experiences, whether pleasant or painful, or neither pleasant nor painful, all this has Thus say, O monks, those free of bonds jainas. O niganthas, you. Modern scholars state that such usage of the term Brahman in ancient texts does not imply a caste, but simply, masters, experts, guardian, recluse, preacher or guide of any tradition. An alternate synonym for Brahman in the Buddhist and other non-Hindu tradition is Mahano. Outside South Asia, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia and Indonesia Some Brahmins formed an influential group in Burmese Buddhist kingdoms in 18th and 19th century. The court Brahmins were locally called Puna. During the Kanbong dynasty, Buddhist kings relied on their court Brahmins to consecrate them to kingship in elaborate ceremonies, and to help resolve political questions. This role of Hindu Brahmins in a Buddhist kingdom, states Leiter, may have been because Hindu texts provide guidelines for such social rituals and political ceremonies, while Buddhist texts don't. The Brahmins were also consulted in the transmission, development, and maintenance of law and justice system outside India. Hindu Dharmasastras, particularly Manumriti written by the Brahmin Manu, states Anthony Reid, were greatly honored in Burma, Myanmar, Siam, Thailand, Cambodia and Java Bali, Indonesia as the defining documents of law and order which kings were obliged to uphold. They were copied, translated and incorporated into local law code with strict adherence to the original text in Burma and Siam and a stronger tendency to adapt to local needs in Java, Indonesia. The mythical origins of Cambodia are credited to a Brahmin prince named Kaundinya, who arrived by sea, married a Naga princess living in the flooded lands. 
Kadinya founded Kambuja Desa, or Kambuja transliterated to Kampuchea or Cambodia. Kaundinya introduced Hinduism, particularly Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva and Harihara half Vishnu, half Shiva, and these ideas grew in Southeast Asia in the first millennium CE. Brahmins have been part of the royal tradition of Thailand, particularly for the consecration and to mark annual land fertility rituals of Buddhist kings. A small Brahmanical temple Devasathan, established in 1784 by King Rama I of Thailand, has been managed by ethnically Thai Brahmins ever since. The temple hosts Phra Phikhanesan Ganesha, Phra Narai Narayana, Vishnu, Phra Itsuan Shiva, Uma, Brahma, Indra Saka, and other Hindu deities. The tradition asserts that the Thai Brahmins have roots in Hindu holy city of Varanasi and southern state of Tamil Nadu, go by the title Pandita, and the various annual rites and state ceremonies they conduct has been a blend of Buddhist and Hindu rituals. The coronation ceremony of the Thai king is almost entirely conducted by the royal Brahmins. See also Notes References Further reading Baldev Upadhyaya, Kashi Ki Panditya Parampara, Sharda Sansthan, Varanasi, 1985. Christopher Allen Bailey, Rulers, Townsmen, and Bazaars, North Indian Society in the Age of British Expansion, 1770–1870, Cambridge University Press, 1983. Anand A. Young, Bazaar India, Markets, Society, and the Colonial State in Bihar, University of California Press, 1999. M. N. Srinivas, Social Change in Modern India, Orient Longman, Delhi, 1995. External links Brahmins and Pariah, an appeal and record of colonial era conflict in Bengal The Wisdom of the Brahmin, Friedrich Ruckert translated from German by Charles Brooks.